women sailing the sky. I walk between them, they who wear silk, muslin and burlap skins touching mine, they who dance between urine and violets, they who are soiled, disinherited angels with masculine eyes. This earth is heart symmetry, this earth of feverish wars, this earth inflamed with hate, this patch of tongues corroding the earth's air, who will journey to the place we require of humans? I grow thin on these algebraic equations, reduced to a final common denominator. What are the occasions, if any, when you become aware of your race? Do white Americans underestimate discrimination? Do black people make too much of it? How would the country be different if led by a black man? Americans seem to be spending more time talking about race, but even so, I had the feeling that something was always left unsaid. Who will journey to the place we require of humans? Blacks and other people of color often seem to talk about race more openly, while many whites appear to yearn for a post-racial world where such discussions are unnecessary. Post-racial, there's that word. People may be talking about race more, but they're not necessarily talking to each other. Now, I've always known that my racial identity has largely been forged by the sum of my experiences and my formative memories that flow through my parents' lives from their struggles and tribulations, their triumphs and celebrations, their dignity found in a hard day's work, the devotion of our worship, the places that we lived, and above all, above all, the constant expectation captured by one word, rise. No matter, no matter what, move forward, never backward, always onward and upward. Rise and shine, rise to the occasion, rise above it all. Don't let up, don't look back, don't slow down. Ignore the slights and the slurs that try to keep you from achieving your goals. Always keep the prize in mind. See it, smell it, feel it. I was shaped by the advice and admonitions that rained down on me. I have always known that. What I did not know is that I was also shaped by the weight of my parents' silence. I had hoped that other people would speak candidly about race, but I came to understand that my reporting had to begin with me. The discussion about race within my own family was not completely honest. The truth can set you free, but it can also be profoundly disconcerting. Secrets. Secrets. As a young man, my father had been shot by a white policeman. He never spoke about the incident after leaving Alabama and moving north, but my mother, she, too, never talked about the time her mother spent working as a traveling Aunt Jemima, wearing a hoop skirt and a headscarf. How many of us know the whole truth about our families? One of the unforeseen consequences of the rise of President Barack Obama has been a grudging willingness to shed painful memories, fears, biases, hopes, and insecurities, all those things that so often are left unsaid when people try to talk about race. Who will journey, I say, who will journey to the place we require of humans? That conversation about race, it's happening right now in beauty parlors and truck stops, in college dormitories and courthouses in office parks, at construction sites, and at dinner tables. The conversation is flowing through bodegas and along interstate highways and rural roads. It is filling computer screens. 
I began this project in 2009, this six-word project, this candid, roiling, robust project, the race card project. I'm Dr. Gregory McGriff. Six words, 55 miles per hour means you, black man. I'm an Ivy League graduate and a board certified medical doctor. The subject of race comes up all the time, but the conversation that should follow is usually very short. When I see speed sign on the road announcing 55 miles per hour, I know that posting is meant for me. My white counterparts proceed a bit faster. My name is Karen Lamb, and my six words are navigating the world as transracial adoptive family. I am the adoptive mother to a beautiful boy who is two years old. We adopted him at birth, and he's African American, and my husband and I are both white. I distinctly remember one day having a phone call with an agency in Florida, and the social worker that was speaking with us was telling us about these different fee structures they had based on the ethnic background for the child. And I remember hearing this and just sort of being dumbfounded that they would segregate, to use a loaded term, segregate these children by ethnic background before they were even in this world. My name is Kevin Segura. I live in Brooklyn, New York. No, really, where are you from? Are my six words. I've always thought that I've had a particularly weird face. Having broken my nose several times as a teenager, my face has changed slightly. But I'd look at my parents growing up, and I wouldn't see their faces in my face. But I did see some combination, some mixture. I could see a clear link when I was young between other people and their parents, or for like what a typical American face should be. But I'd look in the mirror, and I'd look around, and I'd think, that's not me. I'd turn away from funerals from morning lightning. I feast on rain and laughter. What is the sound I hear moving through our bones? I breathe out leaving our scent in the air. My name is Alicia O'Brien, and my six words are Mexican white girl doesn't speak Spanish. <laughs> I chose these six words because whites see me as Mexican, Mexicans see me as white, because I don't speak Spanish. I find it interesting that we don't qualify other ethnic identities on the basis of language. I've talked to my father about this, and I've talked to my aunts and uncles individually about this, and they all give me the same reason. They said that they were so prejudiced against growing up in uh, Fort Worth, Texas for speaking Spanish in school that they didn't want their children to endure that. They didn't want their children to get slapped on the wrist. They didn't want their children to get shushed in the lunchroom. They wanted their children to assimilate into the culture. My name is Jessica Hong, and these are my six words. Ask who I am, not what. It's like people need to figure out that I was Korean so that they could put me in their Korean box. And I knew that there was a box, because any time that I told them I was Korean, everything else that was in that box came spilling out. I came to this life with serious hands. I came observing the terrorist eyes moving in and out of southern corners. I wanted to be the color of bells. I wanted to surround trees and spill autumn from my fingers. I came to this life with serious feet, heard other footsteps gathering around me, women whose bodies exploded with flowers. My mother and I went to Lake Martin, Alabama. She had a small lake cabin there. I uh, later realized that she had come to the realization that really, after that day, that all the hopes she had for a simple life were not going to come true for her. 
she would be in the shadow of the schoolhouse door, and I felt a sense of loss for her. Well, you know, his decision to stand in the schoolhouse door seemed pretty illogical to me. He was a lawyer and a former judge, and I, I think he knew that his actions were for a lost cause, and it seemed that he was kind of eager to make his political point and then step aside. And maybe he did it to, maybe to avoid a mob rule, but his actions that day marked him for life. I'm Peggy Wallace Kennedy, George Wallace's daughter. My six words are, I am a Wallace, but different. Life, life is, from curl embryo to greed to flesh, transistors, web pages, life. obscuring butterflies. Life. Our life is a feast of flutes, orbiting chapels, no beggar women life. here, no treasonous spirit life. here, just a life. praise touch created from our spirit tongues. Life. We bring the noise of mountain language, we bring the noise life. of Sunday life. mansions. We enter together, paddling a life. river of risk in order to reshape this wind, life. Life. this sea, this sky this dungeon of syllables. We have become nightingales singing us out of fear, splashing the failed places with light. I walk into a room and the first comment is, well, he's black. And I become aware. Well, the beauty of medicine is you get to meet old people. And so demented patients will have their guards down and usually tell you what's on their mind. But I've had a few non-demented patients ask me to leave the room because I was a minority. I didn't take it personally. And this happens sometimes. Oh, you know, when I was in elementary school, my favorite friend, my, my best friend was Sarah Kim. We hang out every day. I hear about everybody's Korean best friend from childhood. Oh, you know, I tried kimchi once, and I don't know if I liked it. Or I think really the most jarring, the most stirring one was, I would have older gentlemen say, oh, I saved your country. Mm -hmm. I didn't, I couldn't quite. I couldn't quite say thank you. I mean, it was, well, it put me in this really horribly awkward position. We are here on the green leaves, on the shifting waves of blues, knowing once that our place divided us. Knowing that our place divided us. Knowing once that our color divided us. Knowing that our color divided us. Knowing once that our class divided us. Knowing that our class divided us. Knowing once that our sex divided us. Knowing that our sex divided us. Knowing once that our country divided us. Knowing that, that our, our country, country divided, divided us. Now, we carry the signature of women in our veins. Now, we build our reconciliation canes in morning fields. Now, the days no longer betray us, and we ascend into wave after wave of our blood milk. What can we say with our blood? Yeah, wrapped on the knuckles. Just a bit of um, humiliation would occur if they spoke Spanish. My father failed the first grade because he couldn't speak English. You'd never hear of that now. He only spoke Spanish, and so he wasn't able to proceed to second grade. He had to repeat first. An old man came up to me and just started asking me questions in Spanish. And I almost started crying because I was just so terrified. But with varying frequency, yeah. I started conversing with people who would approach me in Spanish. Spanish always sounded like a bird singing to me. It was, my mom would watch the Mexican soap operas and the women always sounded like they were chirping. It was this passing fancy at first. This idea that by people jokingly or mistakenly identifying me as Hispanic, that I thought there was some kind of a safe space there. Uh, you might say that I was given a kind of fictional persona. 
So, yeah, I do feel it propelled me forward, and I very much feel like my own man through the Spanish language. It was so fast and so quick, I couldn't discern where one word ended and another word began. It just all had this very musical quality to it. I couldn't, I couldn't tell, but it was just something I didn't have. It wasn't my language, it was my parents' language. In the hospital, a family was upset with me because I was uppity. They said I said words that they didn't understand. And this is something that I'm sure none of my partners, because I asked them, they never gotten that particular complaint. And so it is never my desire to be uppity. It is my hope, rather, than be the condescending and speak down to anyone, is that just to speak in natural language. I started realizing that, OK, being a parent to a child of a different ethnic background, this is going to be some work. There's going to be a lot of work on our end in order to be successful parents and to get our child ready for this world. And, and if there is a word or two that's a little above your vocabulary, it is not because I'm better than you. It is not because I have more education. And I'm certainly not trying to lord my intellect over you. I'm simply trying to communicate. Her story, her story smiles at us. Little by little we shall interpret the decorum of peace. Little by little we shall make circles of this triangle of stars. We shall strip mine the world's eyes of secrets. We shall gather up our voices, braid them into our flesh like emeralds. Come, bring us all the women's hands. Let us knead calluses into smiles. Let us gather the mountains in our children's eyes. Come, distill our unawakened love. Say hello to the mangoes, the uniformed men, the nuns, the prostitutes, the rain mothers, the squirrels, the clouds, the homeless. Come, come, celebrate our footsteps insatiable as sudden breathing. Love curves the journey of these women sails. Love says, a woman, a woman, a woman, to these tongues of thunder. Come, come, celebrate this prayer I bring to our common ground. It is enough to confound the conquistadores. It is enough to shape our lace, our name. My name is Robert Goins. And my six words are, found my ancestors in grief too. I am a genealogist. I've been researching my North Carolina family for about 10 years now. I found my great grandfather's family in some notes at the North Carolina archive. The family lived in Belus Creek in Soratown. Soratown sounds like sorrow. Mm -hmm. I found a ledger with the name of the overseer of the plantation written in it. When I first read it, it looked like grief. Well, I actually think the overseer's name was Gref, but I could not help but see it as grief. Grief is here. Grief will not let me go any further until I acknowledge it. Finding grief stopped me in my track. I looked at the name, and I looked at the people in the ledger getting supplies like shoes, coal, and I don't know. I was trying to be objective about it and not get emotional with it, and uh, it just shook me. I had to catch my breath. I was looking for specifically Robert and Betsy Hairston, who would be my third great-grandparents. I just noticed on various pages that they would list what each family on that page got. And it was just like they would call them like uh, shoe buckle Negroes. And I, I mean, that, that just really shocked me. I, I, I was like, wow. I, I mean, it's, it's real. It's true. This is what they did. It was a confirmation of maybe all my fears about what slavery was. It wasn't an abstraction. It was, th these, these were people that were my people. Slavery is dealt with in the United States as an abstract, this big amorphous thing, and it is. But there are specifics to it. There's people, I, I mean, when you can trace your family 
and see your family that way, it affects you. My son's getting to an age where I'm starting to get a little bit more concerned about comments. You know, he can't, he's going to start to pay attention very soon, and I'm a little nervous about what we're going to do when he starts to understand why someone approached us at Target and thanked us for saving babies. Or when a woman, you know, walks down the aisle of the grocery store and says, what's he mixed with? I used to say to a friend, well, when you're kind of actually, when you're rebellious and trying to find your identity, I used to kind of say, I'm not Mexican, my parents are, because of the comment that my friend said to me. Well, not really my friend, but the comment that he said, well, you're not Mexican because you don't speak Spanish. I think in trying to figure that out, I started responding to people, well, I'm not Mexican, my parents are. My Japanese father did us a great favor by marrying our Jewish mother. And they made two tall, loud boys. So I guess we've just been in a favorable position in regards to that question. After 72, after the assassination attempt, after many apologies, James Hood and Vivian Malone, the University of Alabama students whose paths he tried to block, they had a private meeting with my father. My father called her an icon of the civil rights movement and how she had conducted herself with great dignity and grace. And uh, his eyes filled up with tears and she reached over and touched his hand as a gesture of forgiveness. Make us become healers. Come, celebrate the poor, the women, the gays, the lesbians, the men, the children, the black, brown, yellow, white, sweat, peeling with stories. You know, I said, well, my son, we adopted him at birth, and you know, his ethnic background is a little different. We don't know a whole bunch about him, but he's a beautiful kid, isn't he? Whenever we would go to Texas, the only thing my grandmother knew how to say in English was, I love you, Miha. I love you. She passed away two years ago. I think about my grandmother and how I wasn't able to communicate with her and that sense of relationship that I lost. If I could speak Spanish with her, I'd say, I love you, mi amor, abuela. When you're a typical uh, you know, shorter, soft-spoken Asian male. You are perceived almost to be weaker or lacking in the fiber that makes a great American leader. I've been in a weird position of just being really tall and loud my whole life. People in Alabama will remember his change from 72 until the day he died. But the world will always see that picture or see his name and there will be an asterisk there and they will know that that's the man that stood in the schoolhouse door. There will be no more schoolhouse door stands. There will be no more Edmund Pettus Bridge violence. There will be no more of that. We've come too far. We've come a long way and I want to be part of that change. It's not like the, the mean kind of racism that we think of when we think of racism. Yes, it's not, you know, blatantly mean or rude or hateful, but it's still, it, it adds up. It's like adding pebbles into a backpack. Eventually your backpack is 20 pounds, you know? I make a point to do something that many of my partners don't do, and most physicians don't do anymore. I sit. I sit in the room, and I ask the patient to tell me their story. I'm really interested in these stories. 
After years of experience, the initial anger that I used to feel that would last for hours, now I compress into a fleeting brief moment, and then I just move on. Hi, Bobo. I spit on the ground. I spit language on dust. I spit memory on the water. I spit hope on this seminary. I spit teeth on the wonder of women, holy volcanic women, recapturing the memory of our most sacred sounds. Aye, Bobo. Aye, 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 Bobo. Aye, 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 I have been wondering about something. I have been wondering about the conundrum of racism. You know it's there, but you can't prove beyond a reasonable doubt how it colors a particular situation. In Fort Wayne, in a large hospital in an unfamiliar city, we were confronting an unknown illness that had swiftly robbed my father of his ability to carry out the most basic functions. The doctor suggested that we quickly move dad back to Minnesota where he could be treated closer to home. By now his speech was so slurred that only I could understand him and so labored that he wasn't able to even whisper. It took him so much effort and focus to spit out a sound that it was slightly explosive when it arrived, like a sputtering engine in a, in a hushed area. At the airport, we sat across from two middle-aged blonde women with wet set curls and matching pink satin jackets, constantly rifling through their pocketbooks for mirrored compacts, then checking their makeup or blotting their lipstick. When my dad tried to lean toward me to ask a question, his words sputtered forth like bricks tumbling from a shelf. The satin dolls found it hard to mind their own business. They stared and pointed every time my father attempted to speak. They didn't try to hide their disparagement. One of them harumphed loud enough for anyone to hear. Goodness sakes, it's not even noon yet. After spending a lifetime trying to be a model minority, my father now sat facing the condemnation of two blonde scolds. They had apparently concluded that he was an early morning lush instead of a gray-haired man fighting a losing battle with a devastating disease. My heart breaks every time I think about the look on his face that day. The jut of his chin showed indignation, but the sag in his shoulders and the crease in his brow conveyed something different, something hovering, hovering somewhere between anger and shame. There was, however, something else, a hint of grace. I see that now that I have come to understand my father better as a man who was always in tight control of his emotions. I believe now that he was trying not just to salvage his own dignity, but to also absolve the two women from dishonor. A less controlled, more impulsive man might have responded by giving those women the finger to shut them up. My father drew strength from reaching past anger. Yes, yes, now that I have come to understand my father better, the aphorism, kill them with kindness, might have been penned with a man like Belvin Norris Jr. in mind, the son of the South, the son of Birmingham, Alabama, who followed the great migration north to the Midwest, a postal worker, quiet, book smart, family strong. My father was visiting his brother when he took ill. And when he boarded the plane that day, he did it early because the flight crew knew that he would need extra time to settle into his seat and also because they needed to check his medical release from the hospital. He was flying alone 
that morning, and this is because I had planned to drive his Oldsmobile back to Minneapolis and meet him there the next morning. That's a decision I have spent a lifetime regretting. Before walking down the jetway, my father motioned for the nurse and the flight crew to wait just a second. He leaned toward me as if he wanted to tell me something, but he couldn't get the words out. He kissed me on the cheek, and it was a loving but clumsy gesture. His balance was off, and so it was almost as if we wound up bumping heads. And though I didn't mind, and I certainly didn't care who was watching as we were locked in this long embrace. My eyes were closed, and I was trying so hard to fight back tears. So I barely noticed when the, when the flight attendant crept into our little circle of grief to gently remind us that they had to stay on schedule. The attendant lightly cupped my father's elbow and led him away. It's disturbing to see your parent treated like a school child. And yet, it's amusing to watch a man grin like a lucky teenager when a pretty woman takes his arm. As I walked away, those women, the, the satin dolls, gazed at me. They, they must have overheard the chat about my father's medical release because they gave me these pouty expressions, these sad smiles, downturned mouths. Hmm. Lipstick contrition. <laughs> I walked past them, and I smiled back. I, like my father, had reached beyond anger to offer conciliation instead. I barely understood it at the time, but I now see I was raised by a model minority to be a model minority, and to achieve that status, certain impulses had to be suppressed. Years later, I understand both the reason and its consequence. I wonder what my father had wanted to tell me but couldn't right before he boarded that plane. Learn all you can, save your money, don't eat too much late at night. More than 20 years later, as still I mourn, I wonder if he was trying to impart some eternal verity before his final flight home to Minneapolis. This would be the last time I saw him alert. Within a day, my father slipped into a coma. Within a week, a fast-growing tumor took his life. Gone too soon. I am my father's daughter. <laughs>